Hey guys, welcome back. So for this one, we're getting into the new 2024 Ultimate Black Panther series, written by Brian Hill, who's also doing an amazing job over in the Blade series. But now with us going back to Earth 6160, this is our proper introduction to the Black Panther, to Wakanda, and really what's going on all over the continent of Africa as a result of the Maker being trapped in the city, which has caused this council to take things into their own hands and expand their dominance across the globe. So with that said, if you enjoy these videos, be sure to drop a like, subscribe if you're new to the channel, and don't forget to hit that bell up top to get all notifications so we can squad up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so starting this out, we begin in West Africa, where we see a group of workers who are just slaughtered by soldiers who are working for both Khonshu and Ra, who are actively claiming more West African territories in their name. Because back when we began our talks on Ultimate Invasion, which gave us our introduction to Earth 6160, it was here where we were first introduced to Khonshu and Ra as members of the Maker's Illuminati, with the two of these guys being the lords of the upper and lower kingdoms, which for the most part is your northeastern portion of Africa, as shown on this map located just above Wakanda. And right now with the Maker being locked away in the city, these two are expanding their dominance over the continent of Africa, showing no mercy to anyone who stands in their way. And we see that this is noticed by a couple of Wakandan spies, where one of them wants to jump down and help these people, but the other stops him and tells him no. Since Wakanda must stay in secret, the only thing they can do is report this to their king. So the two of these spies, they end up leaving and making their way back to Wakanda, which is where we also head to next, as we see King T'Challa waking up from a disturbing nightmare. And with how this is done, we're given something very different early on, because right out the gate, we're shown that King T'Challa is married to Okoye, and it's a fresh take that I'm really digging, because from what we're shown, she still has the background of being the former general of the Dora Milaje, but now as Queen of Wakanda, her position is their high mentor. So for that reason, we'll see that she's very aware of certain things concerning the Dora Milaje, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. But one thing to know about Okoye early on is that she stands firm on the traditions of Wakanda, while T'Challa, on the other hand, he believes that these traditions must change. And we'll learn more about what he believes must change throughout this first issue as well as over the course of this series. Because for T'Challa, as King of Wakanda, he's bound to his traditions, and he doesn't believe that the ways of old are gonna do his people any good going forward. And just moments later, will we see him make his way to the Citadel of Knowledge to speak with his father T'Chaka, who's also the former king and T'Challa's mentor, Right here, even though we're shown his father is very much the traditional type, even with that being the case, he still listens to his son. He recognizes T'Challa as king and he offers him advice in a way that supports how T'Challa thinks rather than trying to force him to be more traditional. And you'll see more of what I mean as this conversation plays out. Because initially T'Chaka asks if T'Challa is still being plagued by these dreams and T'Challa responds by saying that they're just dreams but his father believes that these dreams could be the gods trying to speak to T'Challa. And the reason that he's plagued by them is just because he won't listen. So T'Challa tells his father, perhaps the gods should make their wishes more clear. Which again, you can tell from the start of this conversation that it's playing out like a bit of the old ways versus the new. But at no point is T'Chaka trying to force the old ways down his son's throat. But instead, it just comes to the point where his father asks him if the king has come here to actually listen to his advice. So T'Challa makes it clear that being the king changes nothing and he'll always be in the shadow of his father's wisdom. So right away, T'Chaka tells him to speak to the divine mother of the Vodou Khan, which on the surface might sound like a bit of force feeding of the tradition, which is why initially T'Challa gives a little pushback because he tells his father that she just wants his servitude, almost like a puppet under her beliefs and superstitions. But T'Challa does not trust the Vodou Khan or their ways. And he even goes as far as to say that he believes Wakanda should be free of them completely. And I really like what T'Chaka tells him in this conversation, because first he tells T'Challa no, he shouldn't trust them, but he needs to recognize their power and hide his intentions because they can sense his doubt. Because the smart thing for T'Challa to do right now is to go and see the mother of the Vodou Khan, tell her about his dreams, and that'll show them that he'll listen. Because going forward, T'Challa needs to keep the Vodou Khan close until he decides their fate. Because one should only know that they're an enemy of the king after they're destroyed. Which again, is great advice from a father to a son, from a former king to the current king, because he's not trying to force his ways on T'Challa, but instead he's teaching T'Challa how to move forward with what T'Challa believes that he should do. So T'Challa ends up going over to the temple of the Vodou Khan 
to meet up with the Divine Mother, who's also referred to as the Sacred Mother of the Vodukan, Matron Imala. And after telling her of his dream of pain and suffering, she asks, what did that teach him? And he tells her, I learned from books, not dreams. So she says, you underestimate dreams, King T'Challa. And he tells her, the Vodukan underestimates me. I am not my father, Matron Amala. Which, right away, you can tell this is a conversation that T'Challa didn't want to have. And the only reason he's here is because his father suggested showing up and playing nice as a way for T'Challa to keep them unaware of the fact that he wants to get rid of the Vodukan as far as their influence on his throne. And for a moment here, it almost seems like Matron Amala is somewhat aware of T'Challa's true intentions because for a moment, she just starts to go on about how the Vodukan has served Wakanda since its birth and how it's been their connection to the gods. And in a way to prove that they also want to offer this to him, she informs him that in meditation, they have sensed violent enemies in their midst, as well as enemies outside their walls, as she goes on to warn him that he should trust no one because his dreams are a warning. The gods are on his side, but gods can be fickle. And hearing this just has T'Challa telling her that he won't be paralyzed by paranoia because it almost sounds like she wants him to be in fear of everyone since he can't trust anyone. But that's not the case because she tells him, do not choose fear, choose awareness, which is also some good advice. And it lets T'Challa know that Matron Amala has his back. And later on, when we head over to the royal court, we see that the two spies from the beginning of the story have made their way back, bringing their report to T'Challa about Khonshu and Ra slaughtering people in West Africa and taking their land. And one of the spies even makes the suggestion that they marshal a small group of warriors, including some of the Dora Milaje, to head back out there and hunt down these marauders. But King T'Challa shoots this idea down simply by saying, I take information from spies, not strategy. You are dismissed. Thank you. And it's just like, man, that's some king talk, ain't it? But this decision to not take action, it upsets Shuri because at first she thinks T'Challa doesn't believe them and he assures her that he does. But at the same time, he's not trying to blindly send Wakanda to war. And Shuri crosses the line here because she tells him father would act, which more or less translates to you don't know what you're doing here. So T'Challa tells her father is not king and I did say we wouldn't act. And as he continues to tell her the reasons why, he lets her know it's because they need information, reconnaissance. They need to know what they're after and why because once they know these things, then they can consider war, which of course to Shuri, this doesn't really help because it sounds like a whole lot of sitting around talking and thinking without anybody doing anything. While in the meantime out there, more innocent people are suffering and dying. So Okoye backs up T'Challa and she tells Shuri that being careful is the right decision because with Wakanda being unknown to the outside world, when the time comes that they do decide to make that kind of move, they'll only have the element of surprise once. So Shuri's just like, I understand, and she walks away, but you can tell it's still bothering her. And after she leaves, T'Challa thanks Okoye for having his back, but she tells him there's no need to thank her because she truly believes this is the right decision. And for T'Challa, with him seeing how Shuri responded to all this, he believes that his sister truly wants to go to war. But Okoye tells him that's not true. The Dora Milaje want war, and they want Shuri's genius to help them wage it because the only people who fear peace are soldiers, because when there's peace, they have no purpose. And this is something that Okoye is well aware of, and not just about soldiers in general, but also about the Dora Milaje, as far as how they feel and what they want, with her being their high mentor. And after this, we follow Shuri outside of the Royal Palace, where now we see her having a conversation with the Dora Milaje Captain of Arms, Abeni, who for a moment here asks Shuri, how does it feel to see her mind laid before her? which is really a Benny referring to Shuri's technological achievements on display all around them. But in response, Shuri's just kind of like, man, it feels like all of it could do more. And right away, a Benny can tell that Shuri is referring to beyond Wakanda, which as we know, that would lead to the outside world knowing who they are. And this takes me to one of the things that this series has had me thinking early on, because with Earth 6160 being manipulated by the maker who used time travel to get rid of all the superheroes, you'd think he would have gotten rid of the Black Panther as well, or at least hindered the advancements of Wakanda to some extent. Because even though the people of this Earth aren't aware of the advancements in Wakanda, the maker should be. But I imagine because of his injury and his memory loss, it's possible that this may have caused him to overlook the Wakanda of this world, but I'm not sure if that's exactly why he hasn't exposed or attacked them since he's bringing knowledge here from another universe. But going forward, I'm hoping that we get that answer at some point in this series. But nonetheless, Shuri ends up telling Abeni that more so than her just wanting to share the technology with the world, she wants 
wants the enemies of the innocent to fear them. And as it stands, that's precisely what will happen if any of them trespass in Wakanda. With Abeni knowing that this is weighing heavy on Shuri's heart, she tells her to use this conflict that she's dealing with as fuel for her mind and build them something beautiful. Which has me interested to see what type of creation Shuri's gonna come up with since much like the films, we're going with Shuri as the technological genius here. Which I don't mind, but like I'd mentioned before, in our previous talks on Earth 616 Black Panther, there are some times where I kinda miss Wakabi being the technological genius. Like Secret Invasion when the Skrulls hacked Wakanda, and Wakabi, he hacked them back. So hopefully on this Earth, Shuri being smarter doesn't mean that Wakabi has to be dumber. And I'ma just leave that right there. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. But just after this, we head over to another part of West Africa, where we see a kid playing and just minding his own business as the soldiers of Ra and Kanshu make their way here and prepare to open fire. But just before any harm can come to this kid, out of nowhere Killmonger comes to his rescue by just slaughtering every last one of these guys while telling this kid to go and hide because more are coming. And when they do, this moment gets really crazy for a number of reasons, because for starters, he just looks up and says, my love bless them and the sky just opens up with lightning taking their air support out but as more of these guys close in on Killmonger on foot he throws his axe at this group and just before it hits them it's charged with lightning and just after taking those guys out it returns back to him it's crazy and he goes on to tell the people of this village that their gods and hidden kingdoms will not protect them but Killmonger and the Wind Rider will, which is a crazy introduction that we're given here for Killmonger and his love interest, the Wind Rider, who I'm pretty sure is Storm since she's gone by that name before. And it's just another one of these things in this story that has me super eager to learn more about both of these guys and how the axe came back and how these two even got together, which will probably be a story that tells itself if we end up seeing that a young Storm met Killmonger before Xavier. <laughs> but nonetheless, like I'm sold already. You got me because the more I see about this world, the more interested I am. It just keeps getting better. And next, when we head back over to Wakanda, we find ourselves at the celebration of life, where King T'Challa's giving this huge speech, where he's showing recognition to the people of Wakanda because their efforts built this kingdom, and he's honored to be their king. So he goes on to tell them that they are his strength, they're his family, his faith, his legacy, as we're shown glimpses of things like Shuri constructing her new device, the Vodukan praying, as well as T'Chaka, T'Challa's father, sitting behind him. But suddenly in the middle of this speech, the woman standing on this platform yells for Kanchu, for Ra, as she reveals this huge explosive strapped to her chest. So T'Chaka acts quickly, pushing his son off the platform just before the explosion, with him knowing that T'Challa would be able to suit up into his panther suit on the way down, effectively saving his son as his final act. And now with his father killed, as a result of this terrorist attack, we see T'Challa say, call the queen, and my sister, and the Vodou Khan. Our enemies call themselves Moon Knight. Wakanda is at war. Cause for King T'Challa, now that his father's been killed, he's no longer trying to play it safe. And pretty soon this world is gonna get to know Wakanda, and the Black Panther. And so now real quick, I wanna give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here, who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dopespill. But that'll do it for this one guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.